Hello everybody, I'm Dr Davina Lloyd and I'm the Chair of the Steering Committee of the Fedor Pe People's Tribunal. And with me today is Andrew Byrne, who is a Professor of Law at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and who was Chair of the Australian Human Rights Centre from 2005 to 2017. He's had many publications on women's rights and in particular on people's tribunals. So I'm going to ask him to start with to explain to us all, as many people have asked me, exactly what is a people's tribunal and how is it helpful? Welcome, Andrew, and thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Davina, for the, for the opportunity. And uh, I'd like to congratulate those who've been involved in this initiative. I think it's uh, an important initiative and it has the, uh, the uh, potential to bring about some uh, significant advance in the protection of women's human rights uh, in the UK and perhaps more broadly. Well, what is a, a people's uh, tribunal? Uh, they've been around in really since the late 60s, as you know. They started with an institution called the Russell Tribunal, set up by Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre. That one looked at the violations of international law and international humanitarian law in Vietnam committed by uh, allied nations, the United States and its allies. And what they do, what they try to do is um, bring civil society concerns, so non-governmental organisations who are concerned about particular practices or acts of states, but also of international organisations and more recently transnational corporations, uh, where those international, uh, where those actions violate international law or human rights or humanitarian law. So there are response to perceived violations of international law and sometimes of other bodies of law like indigenous law. And they generally form, come out, arise out of a, a civil society activist movement, an advocacy movement uh, in relation to particular uh, issues. Uh, and they respond to a sense that national systems, legal systems or political systems or the international system doesn't offer a remedy for these violations. It doesn't give people the opportunity to tell their story, to hold states or other actors to account against the international obligations that they've accepted uh, and to use a forum, uh, a public forum, to try and draw attention to that and to move the community and the state towards compliance with those obligations. The form they take can vary, but the sort of uh, form of a tribunal that is, is quite common is the one which is proposed for the CEDAW People's Tribunal. And the idea is to bring together eminent persons, whether they be former judges, Nobel laureates, uh, eminent experts in particular areas, women's rights, economics, or, or whatever, to constitute them as a tribunal, they're sometimes called jurors, and then to put a series of questions to them about whether the actions which are going to be proved by evidence uh, constitute violations of international law, asking them to examine the material that would be put before them by witnesses and in the form of documents, and to reach an assessment, a reasoned assessment, which is impartial, informed, uh, on whether there has been a violation of international obligations or a failure to fully implement international law. Generally, that then results in some form of judgment which may contain recommendations. Of course, it doesn't have the force of a state set up court. It has moral force based on the status of the people, the process of reasoning, the cogency of the evidence that's put before the tribunal. And the judgment then becomes a tool for advocates to work with in working with government, parts of the community in order to give a better effect to the human rights or other international legal obligations. There have been many, there's been the Russell one, there's been a famous Tokyo Women's uh, Tribunal in 2000, which dealt with uh, violations of uh, the rights of women, particular sexual violence during the Second World War, 50 years after it's, there have been people's tribunals on minimum wages, on violence against women more generally, on uh, uh, repressive regimes in various countries, 
and on the role of transnational organizations and international financial organizations in the international uh, economic uh, power structures. So that's a, that's a broad overview. There's a lot of activity, and this fits into a long and uh, well thought of and much used uh, tradition of informed activism, which is informed by evidence, which draws on law and legal standards to advance its case. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's a very, very good and very, very concise explanation of exactly what we're trying to do. Now, I know you've also had a lot of dealings with CEDAW itself and that um, you've actually been involved in the drafting of CEDAW optional protocols, uh, initially for those people with disabilities, but you're currently working on one for the human rights of older people. I wonder if you could explain what a CEDAW optional protocol is in this context. Okay, yes, I, I, I'm sure that uh, most people who are viewing this, hopefully everyone who's viewing this, uh, is aware of the CEDAW convention itself, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, adopted by the United Nations in 1979, ratified by the United Kingdom in 1986. Uh, and that's often called the Women's Bill of Rights. So it's a, it's a non-discrimination convention which design, is designed to uh, impose obligations and to bring about uh, uh, equality for uh, women across all areas of, of economic, social, civil, political uh, life. Uh, and about 20 years after that convention was adopted, the uh, United Nations saw fit, the Commission on the Status of Women initially, to adopt what was called an optional protocol, an addition uh, to the, the treaty, which uh, states that had ratified the treaty could also sign on to, uh, become parties to. And what that optional protocol does is, is it sets up two procedures. The first is what's called, a, in UN jargon, a communications procedure, an individual complaints procedure, whereby if you come from a state which has ratified the convention and the optional protocol and think that they've violated your rights under the convention and you haven't been able to get a remedy at the, uh, the national level, uh, then you can take the complaint to CEDAW and the committee will look at it and come to an assessment after an exchange of uh, material from you and, and the government as to whether the government has in fact violated your uh, right under the convention. It's not binding like a court judgment, but uh, states are meant to look very carefully at it and indeed they're meant to follow the recommendations. They don't always do so, but uh, it is something that one can use uh, in advocacy. The other uh, aspect, and there have been a number of cases brought against the UK, uh, although not, I don't think many, if any, have got to the, the merits. The other part of the optional protocol is what's called the inquiry procedure, which allows someone uh, in a state which has accepted the convention and the optional protocol uh, to bring material to the committee alleging that there are grave and systematic violations of the convention in the particular state. And if the committee is satisfied that that hurdle, that there's, there's a reasonable case that that's happened, uh, they can then initiate a formal inquiry, which may involve a visit with the consent of the state, uh, resulting in a final report. And indeed, there have been about, about half a dozen of these, including one in relation to uh, the United Kingdom in, in the context of Northern Ireland and its laws on access to uh, abortion. So they're available under the, uh, the CEDAW, uh, CEDAW optional protocol uh, from the UK and indeed from, from other countries. And there are similar provisions under the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, and there's currently, there are currently proposals to try and get a new Convention on the Rights of Human Rights of Older Persons, and hopefully also an optional protocol under that. But we're still trying to get a few governments uh, to, uh, to join those that are advocating it, including the UK government. Uh, it would be nice to have them on board uh, looking after the human rights of older persons, because of course the gender dimension, the human rights of older women, are also a critical part, given that women actually form the larger part of the uh, the older population. Now, there in these uh, these procedures and remedies also you have to remember are, uh, are accompanied by a re regular reporting procedure. And the UK reports regularly to CEDAW, uh, and it, and indeed CEDAW gives it a report card, uh, uh, praise for the things that have, have happened that are positive, but also then hones in on the 
areas in which it considers the UK has fallen short. Uh, and indeed, in its last concluding observations in 2019, it identified quite a number of them. And I suppose they will be uh, some of the items focused on by the tribunal. And all of this, yes, of course, yes, is in addition yes, to the European protections. Uh, yes, that are in in the indeed, indeed, Andrew, and I was present at the examination of the UK and the UK was found to be failing um, in lots and lots of respects. And it's a very detailed report that has been given back to our government about the things that they have to put right, which, which leads us to how this CEDAW People's Tribunal will actually uh, potentially improve things for women and girls in the UK. Could you just give us an overview of how, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you don't, well, the government says we don't need it, that everything in the UK is absolutely fine. Um, there would be various women's organisations who would dispute that. But so how is it that CEDAW and the CEDAW People's Tribunal will actually make a difference to the lives of women and girls in the UK? Well, it, it, its contribution, I think, will be on a number of levels. The first, uh, well, I was going to say the first, the most important, but they're all important. One of the very important aspects of people's tribunals is the way in which they help to build solidarity and networks, uh, to bring together people who may be working on different issues around women's equality, women's human rights, uh, and to help them to uh, to build on each other, to network, to have stronger advocacy networks by working uh, together. And I think uh, it's also quite likely to uh, have an important educative effect, and particularly younger generations of women's rights activists or, or younger people to whom CEDAW may actually be a relatively new thing. Uh, and to get them involved and on board, I think, is going to be an important way of broadening the coalitions. In terms of, of substance, I think it does offer the opportunity to hear uh, from voices other than government. Uh, government, of course, um, uh, is always, uh, nearly always convinced that, that, that there's no shortfall in its implementation of international obligations. I say that in relation to my own country, and I'm sure it's, it's if you look at CEDAW records, it's, it, it appears in, in nearly every, every case. Uh, and so it's important, that's why CEDAW has shadow reports, that's why we have CEDAW, to bring an independent, external, detached uh, expert voice. And so I think the People's Tribunal will, in a way, reinforce the work of CEDAW, I would anticipate, but it will do more than that, because as I understand it, there will be current evidence, uh, women's experiences brought before it directly, uh, and the tribunal will then be able to make a, an informed assessment which will obviously take into account what government has done, but also what it hasn't done, and most importantly, the experiences of women. Uh, and many of the problems uh, of implementation identified in the UK are not so much uh, rampant, explicit on the face of legislation discrimination, but indirect discrimination, structural patterns of violence and economic uh, disadvantage. Uh, and I think it's going to be uh, very important for the committee to look at that sort of material. Uh, and once it comes out, I think the, it's not a magic wand. Uh, it will put, give uh, those who are involved in it an advocacy tool to work with government and say, well, here, here is another assessment. You are not living up to your obligations uh, and therefore you must. So it becomes a form of accountability uh, exercise, hopefully. But it will require follow-up advocacy, strong media, all the sorts of things I think that uh, we do as human rights advocates. But it gives us another, another tool, another, uh, another output to, to work with. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I think what we're, we're concluding here is that we really have to get the message out there. We are delighted by uh, the fact that so many young people, um, particularly uh, recently qualified uh, and, and people, uh, law students and people undergoing law studies at the moment, have wanted to get involved with us because it is the younger generation for whom this is going to have the most hope of a better future. As you say, we, we've waited a long time in the UK for a Women's Bill of Rights, and it's about time we all got on board and made this happen. So can I thank you for your support uh, with our CEDAW People's Tribunal? Thank you. Thank you.